Oh yeah, uh, I actually started recording this uh, late one night uh, and decided I I couldn't, <laughs> so uh, I'm going to just play uh, start again. So apologies for that. I haven't been reading ahead of you. I pinky promise. Anyway, let's go. Michaela rubs the back of her neck as she prepares to tell a story. Her face is warm, her throat is tight, and her legs feel like mush. She talks to herself under her breath. Get a grip. Get a grip. But she can't get a grip. Every breath, a struggle. Every movement, a jab in the gut. Her heart drums in her ears. Her brain perceives a threat, and her adrenal glands release a sudden surge of hormones. Adrenaline. Cortisol. The drum beats faster as terror paralyzes her. But this fear isn't physical. She isn't afraid of being burned alive or thrown off a cliff or dropped in a dark pit of writhing vipers. What she dreads is standing on stage in front of strangers and telling them a story. Ask people their greatest fear and the same one always sits at the top of the list. Public speaking. Why would that be? What makes embarrassment so much more terrifying than dismemberment? Storytelling is as old as human history, and Michaela knows it's embedded in her DNA. It's how she makes sense of the world. How she makes sense of herself. How she connects with others and communicates her truth. Finding that connection is Michaela's addiction. She could write her stories to be read, or just let someone else tell them. But Michaela knows she needs more. Much more. She needs the fear, the adrenaline, the fight or flight feeling. But most of all, she needs that visceral connection with her audience. So they see what she sees, believes what she believes, feels what she feels. Every eye watching her, hanging on her every word. Thursdays is open mic night at Moonstone. She told all her friends to come and she doesn't want to let them down. She doesn't want to let herself down. Michaela sits at her kitchen table and tries to write, but nothing's good enough. Every idea seems vapid, dull, stupid. Everything she can think of has already been done. She wants to tap into people's deepest fears. Nothing new under the sun, Michaela. To another reality. Hypnotize them. Hold them spellbound. And for that, she needs a good story. An amazing story. Something that hooks. Oh. Something that raises questions the audience needs answered. Because standing up in front of her friends is one thing. Strangers is quite enough. Her stomach lurches. She feels nauseous. She wants to purge her angst and that piece of banana bread she had with lunch. She loves coffee, but all that caffeine isn't helping her anxiety. Why would anyone want to listen to her? What does she have to say that anyone would want to hear? That's why her story has to be perfect. Surprising. Terrifying, visceral, shocking, flawless, original. And none of her ideas seem good enough. Not one. Michaela lets the last patron saunter out of the moonstone and locks the door. She washes all the mugs and trays and scoops cleans and turns off the espresso machine, wipes out the fridge, sweeps the floor. She works until she exhausts herself before she sits down to write. The fear seizes her almost immediately. Sweat beads on her forehead, drips down her nose, lands on the yellow legal pad smearing the ink. It's not failure that terrifies her. It's exile. Banishment, being driven from the tribe, isolated, alone. 
alone. She arrived at a new school in second grade and didn't know a soul. She sat alone at lunch and tried to eat her tuna sandwich, but she couldn't swallow a bite. She had no appetite, just a lump in her throat. She still remembers that loneliness in her bones. That aloneness is more terrifying than dying. It's primal. She tried telling a story at the Moonstone before, and it didn't go as planned. No. She decided to memorize the story so she wouldn't have to keep glancing down at her paper. But one look at the audience, and she couldn't remember the first word. She froze and stood there like an idiot. Ten seconds felt like ten minutes, and finally she just walked away. She can still feel the heat of embarrassment burning the back of her neck. When comedians don't get a laugh, they call it dying. It's worse than dying. Hmm. Michaela knows her fear is rooted deep in a tiny part of her brain called the amygdala. It's instinct. It's automatic. But knowing that doesn't help. She has to override that fear. She has to silence all those voices in her head. Anyone who ever undermined her, talked down to her, doubted her, made her think she wasn't good enough. Like her teachers. Ooh. Like Mrs. Denson, that her bitch. second grade teacher who didn't know how to teach dyslexic children and who made her feel shame for every misread or misspelled word. Like Mr. Brandy's. That dick. Her 10th grade English teacher who marked up her stories with tons of red ink. Always red ink. He had so many stupid rules. Don't repeat words. Don't split infinitives. Don't start sentences with conjunctions. Don't end sentences with a preposition. Don't, don't, don't. He was all about how not to do it. All about making her doubt her instincts and intuition as a storyteller. All about murdering her joy and killing her creativity with rules that were never even rules in the first place. Rules that made her stories feel unfriendly, contrived, artificial. And she wanted her stories to be the opposite. The exact opposite. Friendly, inviting, honest. Michaela remembers arguing with Brandy's often about his so-called rules and how some of the greatest stories ever told started almost every sentence with a conjunction. She even challenged Brandy's to show her where his rules came from. And he had nothing to say. Nothing to show her. Nothing official, anyway. Just mm. one literary cookbook contradicting the other. Michaela figured one teacher long ago taught a preferred style as a set of rules, and that misguided class went out into the world propagating stylistic disinformation. Probably. She remembers one time when Brandy's handed back her story. She remembers him leaning over her desk. She remembers that smell. The smell of cheap aftershave fighting a losing battle with his B.O. And she hears his ugly words every time she picks up a pen. Some people are born writers. You're not. Don't worry, it's not your fault. Just who you are. But even wow. with all that negativity, she still managed to keep a tiny flame of inspiration alive. A sputtering flame nurtured by all the writers she loved. Mary Shelley. Edgar Allan Poe, Shirley Jackson. They didn't worry about following rules. They just created their characters, told their stories, built their worlds. Quite right. Something about the woman keeps others at a distance. Maybe it's her intensity. Maybe it's her detachment, her otherworldliness. Even in this dark, dangerous place, she seems more connected to the flora, to the trees, the shrubs, the night-blooming flowers, climbing vines, the crickets chirping their night song, moss drawn to the tiny pockets of light that penetrate the heavy black fog, the rats scurrying through the brush. She can sit for hours watching a spider spin its web. 
That's what holds her interest. The living things that somehow continue to thrive in this grim and wicked place. She can't read people the way others can. She can't look at someone's face and understand what they're feeling. The language of human emotion is indecipherable. Her kind, intelligent eyes are framed by big plastic glasses. Her complexion is dark. Her jet black hair, a soft, beautiful cloud of tightly coiled curls. You're talking braids. about Claudette? She moves through the dark mist and her skin prickles with fear. There are dangers in this place. Predators, monsters, the stench of death, the sickly sweet aroma of rotten flesh. The air is damp, cold. The crickets suddenly stop chirping. The abrupt silence stops her in her tracks. She waits, listens, holds her breath. A guttural roar rips the air behind her. When she turns, she sees a scarred and misshapen face. A monster wielding a thundering chainsaw. Terrified crows bolt from the trees. Michaela screams along with the woman and awakes with a start, covered in sweat, lying in the dark. A nightmare. Michaela had a vision of Claudette and Hilda. That's okay. That's cool. I like that. An anxiety nightmare. That's all it was. Julian seems certain. They drink coffee on the veranda at the Moonstone. Imagine how weird Everything that would have been when she normal. ended up there. Safe. Sitting in the sunlight, sipping a latte. So how come I still feel so scared? It's like I'm still in it. Like the nightmare never ended. Julian shrugs. Mm, brains do that. Help us work through our anxieties while we sleep. You're just afraid to get up on that stage and tell your story. Michaela sips her coffee, shakes her head. I don't even have a story. Julian squeezes her hand. You're making it harder than it has to be. He scrapes back his chair, stands. You know what you need? You need to know real fear. Bone chilling, jaw clenching, gut wrenching terror. Uh huh. Julian is such an idiot sometimes. What do you suggest? The quarry. But you know I don't like heights. And that's why you need to just shut up and jump. Maybe. Fear propels her forward, running. Her powerful legs pounding as she hurls herself deep into the dark woods. Shadowy trees appear in the mist as she slaloms between them, pushing, pounding. Whatever predator pursues her is tenacious, huge, powerful, growling, snarling, furious, relentless. It crashes through the brush behind her, single-minded in its hunger. The woman's will to survive is impressive. Michaela both watches her and lives inside of her. Lives in her skin as she runs for her life. Michaela has never felt so powerful, so strong. The world moves by in a blur even as the beast behind her closes the distance between them. She bursts through the trees, fog all around as the ground disappears. And she tumbles into an abyss, plummeting, falling through endless fog. She awakens with a start, her bed soaked with sweat, lying in the dark, her heart pounding. The quarry stump didn't help, not a bit. Michaela regains herself. She has had similar mm. nightmares before. But in those dreams, her legs felt heavy, rubbery, like she was running through molasses, like she couldn't get away. This one was different. It felt so vivid, so visceral. She wasn't herself. Was that she Meg was running else. from Demogorgon? Someone named... Maybe Oni? Mag or Meg. 
Jesus. She sighs heavily. The nightmares feel like they might be more than nightmares. Windows, maybe. Into another reality. Oh, maybe she's read one too many comic books. <sighs> like... I think... Maybe Oni? I'm gonna say Oni. Julian sits in front of Michaela at their little kitchen table. You're running from your fear. So why am I someone else? Because you're a writer. She shakes her head. No, I'm a storyteller. What's the difference? Big difference. Okay, whatever. You're a storyteller. And as a storyteller, you're all your characters. You live inside them, they live inside you. That doesn't mean you're experiencing another reality. But what if I'm not really a storyteller? You're just fishing for a compliment. No, I'm serious. Maybe I'm just a hack. Mick, come on. Take it easy on yourself. You just have to let go. Take a chance. Dive off the edge. Head first in that fog you keep talking about. Face that fear and it will no longer chase you. I don't think it ever stops. Julian stands with a laugh. All right, I'm officially late for work now. He rushes out the door. Michaela finishes her tea and jumps in the shower. She does her best thinking in the shower. And as the hot water pounds her back, she thinks about what Julian said. Are her nightmares messages from her subconscious? Carl Jung believed that our subconscious connects to a collective unconscious that binds every human soul to primal symbols and ancient archetypes. That's why so many fears and phobias are universal. Why so many cultures have the same stories, mythologies, her muscles loosen under the hot spray, and she remembers a writing circle where they talked about something called deja vuism. The idea deja being that human brains could network with mirror beings on the same wavelength in other dimensions. One guy in the group thought that his inner voice was just another version of himself in a parallel dimension. Others in the circle laughed. She didn't. She even shared one of her stories based on a recurring nightmare. The hot water loses its heat, and Michaela suddenly turns it off, just as she's struck by an epiphany. What if she's dreaming real things in a sort of multiverse? What if this world made of nightmares is not a plane of existence separate from the daily reality we all experience? What if it's just one of many realities all existing at the same time? And if there are indeed multiple realities, it occurs to her that every story she creates while asleep or awake might simply be a glimpse into another plane of existence. Michaela shifts. Is that exciting? Side. Maybe all the stories already exist and are just waiting for her to discover them. Maybe writing should be less about torturing and judging herself, and more about opening herself up to the possibilities within the Garden of Infinity. Oh no. Michaela goes to sleep eagerly, not fearfully. She's chasing her nightmares now, excited to slip inside of them thrilled to experience another reality in the infinitude of the multiverse. A dark castle courtyard. Skewer corpses surround a sobbing man. He's on his knees in the dirt as a black fog pulls back, revealing even more bloody corpses. He screams a name. The screaming man doesn't wear medieval garb. He wears jeans, 
a black t-shirt. Running shoes. Michaela sees others now. Somewhere are headphones, carry clipboards. The stonework is actually painted wood. The ramparts are cardboard. The corpses are mannequins decorated to look like the dead. She sees lights, a camera. A sobbing man who's facing his greatest fear. The loss of someone he deeply loves. Taken by the darkness. Taken by the fog. Always the fog. Michaela awakens with a start, but this time she isn't gripped by terror. She's seized by inspiration. She searches her drawer for a piece she started writing years ago. She finds the first draft and reworks it while the images are fresh in her mind. The story pours out of her like she's taking dictation, like she's writing down something that already happened. Because it did. But when Michaela reads the story aloud, it still sounds wordy, prosaic, clunky. Mm. There's no rhythm, no shape, no build, no vivid moments to perform. There's something wrong, something blocking her. And she quickly understands what it is. She still unconsciously follows those rules. Those suffocating rules that were pounded endlessly into her head throughout her years at school. And now the story doesn't flow, doesn't feel alive, feels contrived, heavy, dead. And why? Because she still hesitates to break rules that were never rules in the first place. Ah, that sucks. What's going on with me? Why can't I do it? Michaela hurries into the living room and picks up a few of her favorite books. They all break the rules, all of them. Every writer she ever loved. Twain, Faulkner, Dickens, Poe. Brandes would have given them all Fs in his class. And she can't even imagine what he would have done with quippy young Shakespeare. Shakespeare, who was free from the shackles of the mind placed by process teachers and assembly line thinking. Shakespeare, who was free to create his own rules and words without apology who wasn't worried about what some authority or critic had to say, and they had tons to say. And Michaela knows his freedom was earned after a terrible bout with depression when his first play flopped, and he refused to touch a quill for five years. Five years? It took him five years to meditate on storytelling, to finally break free from the opinions of others. But she doesn't have five years to meditate on storytelling, even though she desperately wants Shakespearean freedom. How do I achieve that kind of freedom after all those years of trying to please others? Shakespeare made his own words and rules, and that's why he's immortal. But I don't need to be immortal. I just need to tell a good story. Michaela clears her head of the swirling negativity and decides to tell the story she wants to tell. Good. She'll need to reduce the story, strip it to its core, cut anything that slows it down, change the passive to the active, use words that paint perfect images in the imagination. And if she doesn't have the right word, she'll make one up. That's what she'll do. She'll make one up. But as the rebellious thought inspires her, it also scares her. Scares the hell out of her because she was taught to idolize final results instead of the struggle, the search, and the climactic fight every artist must go through to be free. To be truly free. The shackles are still there. She feels them dragging her down but they're not as heavy as they used to be. And though she may not possess Shakespearean freedom yet, she can fake it. For now. And now, she rises to her feet and paces the living room as she recites the first draft of her story. She finds places for dramatic pauses, places to add a gesture, places to speed up. Places to shock the audience into gasping or screaming. 
She won't just play to them. She'll play with them. And she won't just tell the story. She'll live the story. So the audience lives it with her. I'm trying to think who she saw. I think it was... I'm going to go with Steve, maybe? The Moonstone is dead quiet and packed to the rafters. Michaela's written and rewritten, polished and burnished, practiced alone and in front of her friends, honed every word, every moment, every movement, every breath. She killed her darlings, anything extraneous. All that's left is only what's necessary to tell the tale. She moves across the tiny stage, commanding the room. The lights dim slowly. She waits until the audience goes quiet. Then she clears her throat and begins. Who here believes in love? I mean, really believes in love. Some audience members lift their hand or make a quick comment that they do. Michaela nods. Love makes us do crazy things, doesn't it? Several audience members laugh, while others seem to go inward. Michaela smiles. Some would turn their back on family for love. Some would give up wealth and power for love. Some would even go to hell and back for love. But there are places in the cosmos far worse than hell. Places where death is just the beginning, and you could lose your soul. Mm -hmm. Would you go to such a place to bring back the one you love? Michaela stops and points at one audience member, and then another, and another. Do you know anyone who would? What I'm really asking is, does love truly conquer all? She soaks in the silence of her captivated audience, inching closer to the edge of the stage, lowering her voice an octave so the audience leans in. And just when they can't take any more, she answers her question with a story. Hmm. Okay. 